So as we get started this morning, I have to ask a question. Is there anybody in here who likes to go fishing? Do we have any fisher, fisher folks in here, fishermen, fisherwomen, fisher persons? I'm not sure what the PC way is to say that. When I was in college, I loved to go fishing. I lived, you have to understand, being raised in West Texas, there was no place to fish. I mean, White River Lake, no. Buffalo Lakes, no. You never knew what you were going to get. You throw a hook in the water in those two places. But when we moved to Central Texas, to Brownwood, Texas, there is a lake there with 90 miles of shoreline. Not only that, they're, they're, that county in that area is full of stock tanks. And don't think I didn't get to know every landowner in that area. I also was such a fisherman that I went and got a topographical map from the office down there in the city hall to find out where the bodies of water were. I actually knew where the conservation lakes were, and I knew where the Corps of Engineer lakes were. And so let me just put it this way. I fished a lot when I was in college. So much so that my professor knew that when me and a certain group of guys during the spring were not in class after lunch, they knew exactly where we were. We were fishing. We were, we were going after the bass and after the hybrids there at Lake Brownwood. Now, during that time, um, I had a car. It was a 1973 Ford Pinto. How many, how many Pinto, former Pinto? And we lived to tell about it. Amen? Those were the cars that if you got hit from behind, what would happen? You're going up in a blaze of glory, right? And so you learn to be a defensive driver when you own a Ford Pinto. So I had my Pinto. We called it the Roland Tackle Box because... Because we kept all of our fishing gear in my car, and that we treated it like a four-wheel drive. We took it out in pastures. We went out in stock tanks, everywhere in that car. It was hilarious. And it was like a powder blue that had oxidized so bad that if you rubbed your finger on it, there would be blue paint on your finger. And people would write stuff on it. And I was like, ah, don't write that. But anyway, that car was legendary. In fact, when, when, when I graduated from Howard Payne, I turned around and handed that car to another student, and the, the legend continued with that car. Although the latest thing I heard back when I gave him that car not long after, he was driving it, and the, the actual brackets on the driver's seat broke while he was driving it, and he literally went completely back while he was driving it. And I thought, man, that, that car is amazing. He, he welded it, fixed it. It, was never, it worked great after that. But that car was amazing. So everybody knew me and these guys loved to fish. That was a big deal for us. So this one guy, his, he had a family member who owned a bass boat. And we didn't have boats, so we were always you know, relegated to waiting or being on the bank or whatever. And we knew every place to go. But to actually have a boat to get out on the water, that was a big deal for a college student that had no money. And so he invited us out, so me and a bunch of guys got together, and when we saw this boat, this was not just a bass boat, this was the monster truck of bass boats. It had a huge engine on it, and it was long, and it had a big old, you know, 30-pound, you know, tro Minn Kota trolling motor on it, and it was just like one of those amazing bass boats. And when he started it up, it sounded like a race car. I mean, I was like, this is going to be fun, but here's the catch. We were going fishing at night. So here we are, we jump on this boat, sunset, it's dark, and it's really dark. The moon's not out, but the water is so glassy smooth. It's beautiful. All you can see are just lights dotting the shoreline all around. So we're cruising around in this boat, and at first we didn't have the lights on. We kind of got a good feel for the lake, but we got over in another part of the lake, and he opens this thing up, and we are hauling. About that time, it begins to dawn on me that at Lake Brownwood, like most larger lakes, there are a lot of docks that jut a good way out into the water. And I got to thinking about it as we're moving at full bore across the water. I mean, we're just skimming the top of the water, wind in your face, anticipating catching all these hybrids and these, these crappie and all this stuff. We were excited. And it dawns on me, what if, and he says, hey, I better turn on the light. And he hits a spotlight, and when he does, there's a dock right there. And we're going full speed at that dock. And at the very last moment, he says, hang on, boys. And he turns that thing, and I bet he sprayed water all over that dock. But, I mean, we barely missed that dock. And the only reason we barely missed that dock was because the light came on. So in the middle of that dark dark place, dark lake, dark water, dark everything, it was a light that saved our lives. I don't know if we'd have been killed, but it would not have been pretty. 
But here's what I know. is All it takes is a little bit of light to dispel darkness. And when that happened, you talk about a poignant moment. First of all, it took me about an hour for the adrenaline to come down, for us to relax and actually enjoy the fishing. The rest of the night was great. And we did catch a lot of fish and had a great time. But just understanding the power of light in the midst of darkness. John Eldridge puts it this way. He says, it's a brutal time to be a human being in our world right now. It's a brutal time to be alive right now. It's not all unicorns and rainbows. Every day is not Friday, right? Right now for us. It's a tough time. It's a tough. I'm not going to enumerate the ways because I don't want to depress us any further. But I'm just saying it's a rough time to be alive. It's a rough time to be a human being. But there is hope. And we are not in this world as those who are without hope. Because we have a light not only for us, but in us. And we're going to talk about that today. Thank you for joining our series. This is called Hallelujah Anyway, because sometimes you just need to shout hallelujah when there's nothing that looks like you could shout hallelujah about. Amen? Amen. So let me tell you this. The, the idea about hallelujah, it's a Hebrew word, and it literally means to praise God or praise the Lord. A shout, a praise, a joy, or a thanksgiving. There's something about when you shout hallelujah in the middle of your mess, you're actually introducing light into a dark place. And I don't know where everybody is. I know there's some folks in here that are in the middle of a dark place. You didn't ask for it. You didn't beg for it. You didn't, you know, vie for it. But it happened. Life happens. Stuff happens. Things fall off. Things break. People move on. People pass on. And here you are finding yourself in the middle of a dark place. But let me tell you something. There's a light. There's the promise of light in the midst of darkness. We're in week five of our series called Hallelujah Anyway. We're moving through the book of Philippians. And if you'll remember, I love the book of Philippians. The book, book of Philippians is a book of joy. It's a book of life. Paul has this great, the affection of Christ for these Philippian believers. And if you'll remember... Philippian, the church at Philippi was actually the first church to be planted in Europe. In fact, it happened after something that you maybe have heard of called the Macedonian Call, where Paul was standing on the shore. He wanted to go up in Bithynia. The Spirit prevented them. He's like, so what do we do now? Where do we go now? I wanted to go here, but something, it's a no-go. You ever had a closed door in your life? So there's a closed door. Well, what happens? God redirects him now, and he receives what's called the Macedonian call. And he follows that call. They determine, he and, and Timothy and Silas determined on that third missionary journey that this was the call to go. They followed that call, and they met Lydia. And when they met Lydia, her and her household stepped over the line to follow Jesus Christ, the first converts in Europe, and it birthed the church, the first church in Europe, the church at Philippi. And it's this group of believers that Paul loved, he had affection for, and they supported him, they encouraged him, and he just found great joy with this particular group of people. In fact, this book is one of the lesser books in the sense that there's not a lot of correction in this book. There's not like him getting onto them for division or him getting, having to correct the Lord's Supper like he did at Corinth or having to correct doctrine like he did in Colossae. It's a book of love and affection and encouragement. The word joy or rejoice is mentioned more than 16 times in this one little short book of four chapters. And we're making our way through it. So listen to this. Today we're talking about empowered to shine. And let me just say something. That means in your darkest moment as well as your greatest. So listen to this. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. Paul says this. Dear friends. Remember he's writing from a Roman prison cell. He's writing from a dark place, but he's writing about the light of life. So in that, he says, dear friends, as he writes, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, well, yeah, duh, he's away. He's in a prison cell right now. He is away. He says, now while I'm away, it's even more important. He says this, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence. And fear. Another way of saying that, and other translations say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
And let me just start by saying this. This word workout, we're not talking about hard toil, sweat of the brow, pull yourself by your own bootstraps, get her done, cowboy up mentality. That would be where I was raised in West Texas. It's actually a sense of intentionality. What work is, is being intentional about something very specific. He's saying, work out your own salvation. Be intentional. Be specific. And he's going to tell us what to do. But he says, be intentional. Be specific in showing the results. In other words, if you're saved, if you're born again, you've given your life to Jesus, you stepped over the line, so to speak, and you're now all in with Jesus, your life should reveal that. Your life should show that you're not exactly who you used to be. You're not who you're going to be, but you're in this process of growth, and it's called sanctification. And in this process of growth, training in righteousness, the Scripture calls it, you are growing day by day. Incrementally, you're becoming larger on the inside than you're on the outside. Your faith is growing. Your faith is increasing. As that happens, people should be able to see your life and say, you are not the same person girl you were in high school. You're not the same person I knew in that other job situation. You are not who I thought you were. In fact, you're different. You should be growing incrementally the rest of your life. Can I get an amen? Amen. We grow every day. Sanctification to be sanctified. How are we sanctified? Because we're justified. You know what justified means? Just if I'd never sinned. That's what justification is. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's the goodness of God and the grace of God at work in your life. Just as if you'd never sinned. So that's us. That's who we are. He says this. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Be intentional. Let it shine out of you. And here's why. Does it mean that we do it on our own? Does that mean that we just have to go around going, okay, how can I prove to everybody I'm a Christian? I'm going to get a T-shirt. That's what I'll do. I'll get a Christian T-shirt. I'll show them all. Oh, no, I'm going to get a bracelet, a little rubber bracelet, because that'll prove something. No, I'm going to get an Ichthus fish sticker for my bumper because I saw a guy with a Darwin sticker on his, and it was eating my fish. I'm, I'm going to show them. Is that what we do? Unfortunately, it is what we do sometimes. And we think that's our witness to the world. A t-shirt, a bumper sticker, a coffee mug, a ball cap. Here it is. He says, for God is working in you. In other words, this isn't even about you. It's about who is in you working their life out of you and through you. This is what this is about. It's not about Jimmy Pruitt. It's about Christ in me, the hope of glory. Colossians 1. Christ in me, but not just in me. That same preposition also means through. Christ in me. Who? Come on, somebody. Now it's Christ through me, the hope of glory, the expectation of God's manifested presence. So it's not even about me. It's about me being intentional. Me showing up and then me yielding to the light that's inside of me to say, all right, Jesus, I'm showing up, but you've got to show out. Because I'm not going to show out. I want this to be about him and his glory. And where do we do this? Where we live, where we work, and where we play. That's where we show up. And when we do, he is working in us and through us. God is working in you. And here's the deal. I love this. He even gives you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Here's what's so cool. Some of you are sitting there going, man, that sounds great, but I'm not as excited as, about, as you are, Pastor Jimmy. Sorry, I don't have your level of enthusiasm. I don't have the call in my life to pastor a church. I'm not you. Well, that's okay. Here's the good news. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with anybody up here. All this has to do with is us yielding to Christ in us and through us doing what he wants. Here's the deal. You don't have the desire? That's all right. God can fix that because all you have to do is say, Lord, help me. I don't have a desire to do this, but according to your word, you're working and you give the desire. See what I'm saying? Take a step back and say, Lord, I don't have a desire, but give me the desire to have a desire. Take a step back and let him impart into you a desire to do this, to do what pleases him. When you do that, he will release the power and the enablement to do so. 
So at the end of the day, it's really not about us. We're just this vessel carrying his presence around and showing up and then saying, all right, Lord, you do what you do in me but through me, and you make a difference in the lives of others. Listen to this. Do, er do a few things, do some things, without complaining and arguing. Is that what the Bible says? <laughs> it says do what? Without complaining and arguing. You do know we have a complaining culture right now, right? We just do. Everybody's whining about something. It's like, would you like some cheese with that wine? Everybody's wham, wham, wham. Somebody call the ambulance. I mean, everybody's upset. Everyone's offended. Everyone's up. Everyone's mad at their boss. Everyone's mad at the government. Everybody's mad at that stop sign that shouldn't be there. Why did they put one there? Why don't they lower the speed limit? Why did they raise the speed? Everybody's mad. Everybody's whining about something. And you know what? It's perfectly common and acceptable in our culture to do so. But he says this, do everything. Can you imagine if you never complained or argued? <laughs> Here's what happened. I know, hard. I'm laughing too, right? It's like, what? I can't even wrap my mind around that. Do everything without complaining. Here's why. So that no one can criticize you. Haters are going to hate, folks. The haters also hate haters. Do you know that? You think, man, if I just join them, become one of them, I just lock in, I'll, I'll hate you. I'll write a comment there. I'll throw, I'll throw my 10 cents in. His haters are going to hate no matter what. They're going to hate haters. And he says this, you set yourself up for being criticized. He says this, live clean, innocent lives as children of God. Clean, innocent as children. Clean and innocent as children. Some of you are saying, but you don't know my kids. I'm just saying. <laughs> Clean, innocent lives as children of God, sons and daughters. And he says this, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. John Eldridge, to repeat, it's a brutal time to be a human being. It's a dark world out there. But guess what? It was dark in the beginning. Do you know that human nature has never changed? Everything around us has, technology, industry, the industrial age, industrial revolution, everything has changed around us, the trappings, sound systems, lights, all this. Can you imagine John Wesley, what he was thinking? George Whitfield, if they had this stuff, they'd be like, what? But human nature has never changed since the garden. Listen to this. Bright lights. You are the light of the world. This is Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, your intentionality, your purpose, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Listen to this. The light of Jesus cannot shine in and through you if you're hiding behind a mask. When I read that scripture in the Sermon on the Mount about putting a bushel over it, we don't put a bushel over a lamp, a light. What would be the point? It would hide the very purpose and design of it. And yet this, we live in a world where it's easy to just put on a mask and hide. You know what happens when we put on a mask? Not only do we hide our true self, which is that's why we do it, right? Not only do we hide our true self, we hide the light that's in us. We put on a mask. Have you ever been, have you ever put on a mask for any period of time? It's hot, sweaty, hard to articulate, hard to see through those little holes. It, it, it encumbers everything. It becomes a hazard to everything. Try driving with a mask on. Besides getting pulled over and hauled in for being a freak, it's, it's, it's hard to function normally when you have a mask on. What does this sign on this wall say over here? For those of you who are new to our church, there's an invisible sign on that wall. It's been there for a long time. It says, no perfect people allowed. We're, I'm introducing and unveiling a new sign today. Are you ready? It's over on this wall. And it says in big, bold letters, no masks allowed. No masks 
allowed. Now that might strike terror in some. But here's the deal. If we don't see the real you, we don't see what's behind you. And who is behind you? It's Jesus wanting out, saying, if you would just take the mask off, I can shine through you. I'll shine in you, but I also want to shine through you. You say, yeah, but you don't know me. And what if people knew the real me? They wouldn't like me. There are people who don't like to fake you. I'm just getting it out there. <laughs> Why not be real? Right? I'll say it nicely. You're darned if you do, darned if you don't. A few years ago, I would have said that differently, but you get the idea here. Bottom line is, they're going to dislike you either way. Why don't you go ahead and rip the mask off and say, look, here I am, no perfect people allowed, no mask allowed, and here it is. This is me, but oh, let me tell you how good God is. Let me tell you how good Jesus is. Let me tell you what he's doing in me and how far I've come. I'm not where I'm going to be, but I thank God I'm not where I used to be. I am on a journey here. And it may just be step by step, baby steps, just one little deal at a time. And it may be a year, but whether it's a millimeter or a mile, I'm going to choose to celebrate and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. I'm not where I was last year. I'm not where I was two years ago. You're working in me. And I now am justified just as if I'd never sinned because of what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do in my life as we continue on the journey. Amen? So listen to this. In him, in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Susan, if you can just bring the lights down just for a second. So, this is how simple this is. He says, you are the light of the world. Okay, it's not much, right? This, this is a little, it's kind of weird. It's ultraviolet, so I'm seeing strange things, but this is an ultraviolet light. It doesn't put out a lot of light. I mean, you can kind of see the step right in front of you, and in a dark room, it does provide some light, and it doesn't take much light in a dark room. I see your iPad is glowing. It kind of looks spooky there, actually, Doug, but he's, he's got that thing going. But it doesn't take much light to light a room. But here's the thing. When we begin to yield to Jesus, something happens. You've got a light going on in you anyway. But what happens when Jesus shows up? This is what happens. Do not look in the light. You will see spots for the next 20 minutes, I promise. This is about 750 lumens here in this little light. This little light that I'm going to let shine right let it shine sing it with me let it shine let it shine the power of a light the power of a light in what John Eldridge calls a brutal world a dark world it doesn't take a lot of light to light up a room to light up a home to light up your workplace, to light up the places where we play, where we recreate. We don't say, all right, I'm going to go to this place, but I'm going to turn my light off now. And then we leave that place, now, okay, all right, I'm back. And then we don't go into our home and go, you know what, I'm in a bad mood, I don't feel it today, I'm sitting out in my driveway, I don't even know if I can face the kids when I walk through the door, much less my wife who's been with them all day and mad. They're gonna hand, she's going to hand these kids to me at the door. So I'm going to turn off the light. And then later when I get ready for bed and I read my version Bible and I catch up from being seven days behind, I'm going to turn my light back on. <laughs> and then when I go to work, oh, it's going to be a rough day. I got to get in this dude's face. I got to do this deal. I got, I got, but when I go home, then I, wait, it's Friday night. You know, I kind of want to go play. I've, I've had a rough week. I, I deserve, I deserve some fun. So Jesus, you just have to wait. 
I wake up on Saturday morning, ooh, I've got a headache. Oh, what happened? Lord, help me. Lord, I'm tired of making these mistakes. I'm tired of doing this. Saturday night rolls around. Sunday morning rolls around. (laughs) Get the picture? Get the idea? As though we can turn Jesus off and on or leave him outside the door. He's saying, let your light shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Okay, we can bring all the lights up and everybody's seeing spots now. (laughs) Wow. Okay, dim them just a little. (laughs) Listen to this. Paul says, hold firmly. Because here's the deal. It's not enough just to let your light shine. It's not enough to just show up and say, okay, if I show up, Jesus will do. Listen, he actually, there's something for us to do. We get to participate in this. And so here it says, hold firmly to the word of life. But it also means in the original language, both to hold to the word of life, but also to hold out, to extend out. It's not enough just to show up. We also need to, as he leads us, as he directs us, as he guides us, offer the word of life to others. I love the way Henry Blackaby, he says this, we look to see where God's working, and when we see his activity, it is now his invitation for us to join him in his work. Did you get that? In other words, we don't go out and make something happen. We don't generate the light. We simply let the light be what it is. We let it shine, but now... When someone says to you, how can you live up in a down world? How can you smile? How can you have joy when the the wheels just fell off of your life? That is the activity of God when somebody asks you a question. And what do you do? You simply step into alignment with what God's doing, and you join him in his work. Jesus said, me and my father, we've been working even up until now. And then Jesus says this, I only do what I see my father doing. Jesus, the clue to Jesus bearing crazy fruit was that he got in alignment with his father. And when he saw the activity of God, he stepped into it and joined him in his work. Jesus didn't try to make things happen. He just joined in on what God was already up to. God is working all around us, family. He's working all around us, where you live, where you work, where you play. And what what do we do? We align ourselves with him. We yield and say, shine your light through me. And when people ask questions, we do what a good witness on the stand does. We answer the questions. There should be something about our lives that is compelling enough that it generates questions from others. And they want to know, how is it that you're able to navigate this? How is it you're able to navigate the landmines of life that seem to be blowing everybody else up? And you just had this happen, but you're still smiling. You still have joy. You still, you seem okay when no one else is. Just answer the question. I've got a helper. I've got a helper. I've got a counselor. I've got a comforter. His name's Holy Spirit. His name's Jesus. It's God the Father. It's my faith. Let's go ahead and invite our worship team to come on up. We're going to go out with worship today. Listen to what Paul says and how he lands this. He says, hold out, offer, hold on to the word of life. Then, on the day of Christ's return, Paul says, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. He says, I've invested in you, I've poured out in you, and now I get to see a harvest come back. That's the, that's the law of sowing and reaping. Look what he says. I'll rejoice even if I lose my life. He says, if I don't get out of this prison cell and they take my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering. There's a pouring offering in Greco-Roman times where they would pour out wine on the ground. Don't cringe anybody. They would pour out wine on the ground and they would say, this is me offering my life for you. This is my covenant. I'm pouring my life out on your behalf. It's a drink offering. And he did the same thing. He says, just like your faithful service is an offering to God, and I want all of you to share that joy. Notice the word joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. You can see on the screen, these are, these are things that we've been engaging in on an ongoing basis, how we make it real for real life, and you can read those for yourself. 
as we land the plane, as our team gets ready to sing. You have a light. It's already there. If you've given your heart to Jesus, you already have this. In fact, I would stop asking for more and start releasing what you already have. He's not going to bring more light from the outside in. He already lives in you. And he's already working in you. He's already there. But now it's us taking the mask off, taking the bushel off and saying, it's time to shine. So I say that to you, church family. It's time to shine. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word, the words of life. Thank you, Jesus, that you've said that You're the light of life, the light of men, and we get to be the light of the world. We get to reveal Jesus. We get to be your ambassadors. We get to represent, to represent Jesus. Holding out, offering the word of life, the word of hope, the word of grace. I pray for my friends here. Everybody here is on a different journey, stage of the journey, a different place. I just, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here and you've never stepped over your line to go all in with Jesus, I want to invite you today. You got to see this in six people's lives demonstrated where they said, I'm all in. My old life is being buried with Christ, but my new life, I am raised to walk in new life. If you're here this morning, you want to give your heart to Jesus. You want to, you're ready to take a next step on this journey of faith. You want to engage him we want to invite you and we're going to have our prayer team up here in fact i want to invite our prayer team to come on up they're here for you they will pray with you they will walk you through that step and help you on that step in the journey you may be here and just you're in that dark place and your light doesn't seem to be shining right now listen if you want help we're here to help We're here to pray with you, stand with you, and depending, we can get you the help you need. We are here to help you. So if you're here today and you want to pray for any reason, and it may be you need to pray for someone else, there's something about when two on earth agree is touching anything, God shows up. So we want to pray with you and stand with you. Let's all stand to our feet. We're going to go out with worship. Those of you who want to come pray, we're here for you.